Hello, I'm John Luke. Welcome in the name of Jesus for this time of worship. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. This is the season of preparation for Easter. And we are beginning a new worship series called Songs of the Heart. Music has the power to sort of transport us through time and space so quickly. Songs can inspire and challenge, courage and, and comfort us. And so this series looks at a number of songs, psalms, written by people, many just like us. And perhaps they didn't win a Grammy or top the charts, but they have the power to move us and inspire us and transform our lives. So for this Lenten series, I'm again doing something I've never done before. You know, we just had this story church series for the last six weeks in which I, I told a story that I wrote. And, and now I'm doing something uh, brand new again. And that is I am meeting with a group of preachers from other congregations to prepare these sermons. Of course, the sermon will be unique in each of the congregations as each pastor preaches differently. But they are also so much more richer with the diverse voices coming together. And every week, you'll have the opportunity to see a brief video of one of the pastors from that group giving an introduction to the scripture. So you'll, you'll be able to see who I'm working with, what other congregations are, are doing this. Thanks for joining with us. We'd love to connect with you. A great way to do that is over at SalemChurch.life. That's a great place for you to take your next step. And please consider sharing this worship video. It usually is easy as a click to share Jesus with others. Welcome. Do you practice contemplation? In our lives and in our world that have become so busy and so noisy, do you find a space of quietness to be with the Lord? There's a saying that you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. And likewise, when wine is made, the grapes are pressed and crushed. And now this is a similar process in our lives as God is making us into these new creations that we're meant to be. Breaking the ground 
Father, we abandon ourselves into your hands. Do with us what you will. Whatever you do, thank you. We are ready for all and we accept all. Let only your will be done in us and in all your creatures. There is nothing better than this. O oh Lord, into your hands we commend our souls. We offer ourselves with all the love of our hearts. For we love you, Lord. We so need to give ourselves, to surrender ourselves into your hands, without reserve and with boundless confidence. For you are our Father. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Mike Morgan at Marion Methodist. One of the beautiful things about United Methodism is that we are connected in mission, ministry, and in the next few weeks in worship. Your pastor, myself, and a few others have been working together in the study of the Holy Scriptures to prepare for the holy season of Lent. Today, we'll all be preaching on Psalm 39. I pray that you are blessed in the hearing of God's holy word today. In this new series, Songs of the Heart, we turn from where we've previously been reading stories to now reading poetry. We're going to be shaped and formed by these songs, these poems, these psalms. And Psalm 39, our text today, is, uh, is a song about the brevity, the difficulty of life. Hear these words. I said... I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will keep a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. I was silent and still. I held my peace to no avail. My distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. While I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, let me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing in your sight. Surely everyone stands as a mere breath. Surely everyone goes about like a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. They heap up and do not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am silent. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am worn down by the blows of your hand. You chastise mortals in punishment for sin, consuming like a moth what is dear to them. Surely everyone is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. And do not hold your peace at my tears, for I am your passing guest, an alien like all my forebears. Turn your gaze away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do you practice the spiritual discipline of contemplation, sitting in God's presence? Really, Christian contemplation is listening to God's voice. It's being shaped and formed by his word, by the relationship that we have with God. In his classic text on spiritual disciplines, Richard Foster, he says, in contemporary society, our adversary majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. And if he can keep us engaged in the muchness and the manyness of life, he will rest satisfied. He goes on to quote psychiatrist Carl, J Carl Jung, who once remarked, hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. And Richard Foster goes on to say, if we hope to move beyond the superficialities of our culture, including our religious culture, then we must be willing to go down 
into the recreating silences, into the inner world of contemplation. Eight years ago, I did just that. I, I spent a week with the monks over at New Melloray Abbey near Dubuque. This is a quiet place. It's a peaceful place. It is certainly a place for contemplation. It was both wonderful and difficult. It usually takes a couple of days into, to get into this sort of schedule, and, and it did for me. They gather in this uh, wonderful transcendent stone sanctuary seven times a day in order to pray, beginning at 3.30 in the morning, 6.30, 9.15, 11.45 in the morning, and then 1.45, 5.30, and 7.30 in the evening. And the Psalms are the basis for their time of prayer. They sing the psalms by chanting them. They follow this daily practice, uh, praying seven times a day, because they know the rest of us don't. So they do it for us. The rest of us, the rest of our lives, tend to be sort of mired in the noise and the hurry and the crowds, the muchness and the manyness of life. And that's why I went to gather with the monks, to get away from all of that muchness and manyness in life, to spend some time in contemplation, sitting in God's presence. So what about you? Do you ever stop and wonder what life is all about? Are you intentional about sitting in God's presence, or are these things, the, the noise, the hurry, the crowds, is all of that a struggle for you? The reality is, and we know this, it's kind of a struggle for all of us. There's a song from the 1970s, Dust in the Wind by the band Kansas, and it struck a chord, so to speak, with people, and it, it became kind of a song of our hearts when they sang, I close my eyes only for a moment and the moment's gone. All my dreams pass before my eyes, a curiosity, dust in the wind. All they are is dust in the wind. Of course, we began Lent this past Ash Wednesday saying, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And that's the sentiment in Psalm 39, our biblical song of the heart. The writer begins by saying, I tried to stay silent. I tried to keep my peace, but I burst open. God, how many days will I live? How long am I going to live? How much time do I have left? A human life is like a, like a puff of air, dust in the wind. The psalmist goes on, people wander around like shadows. They hustle and bustle, but pointlessly. They don't even know who will, who will get the wealth that they've amassed. And interestingly, that's one of the lines from the song, Dust in the Wind. Now, don't hang on. Nothing lasts forever but earth and sky. It slips away, and all your money won't another minute buy. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, in his poem, A Psalm of Life, echoes what troubles the psalmist. He says, Art is long, and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating. Funeral marches to the grave. Do you ever feel this way? Can you identify with these songs, with our psalm? Is this how we feel as human beings? There is this tension in life, this ambiguity between beauty and brokenness. It's terrifyingly short and wonderfully awesome. Sometimes we shout and sometimes we're reduced to silence. One moment we're stunned by all we accomplish and the next we're destroyed by our utter insignificance. This is what the psalmist sings and, and I imagine we can identify with this. So, so what? Is that it? Is that all there is? No. Because the next line from the song, the psalm, is the heart of the matter. 
So now, Lord, what should I be waiting for? My hope is set on you. Deliver me from my sins. Don't let my life be a joke. Before you, I am completely silent. That's what it's all about. See, our hope is in the Lord God Almighty who created us from the dust of the earth and gives us life. And this life means something. It is a gift. Yes, it is beauty and heartache. It's love and loss. It's joy and sorrow. But there is this wonderful interplay between God and humans, this interaction, this cooperation, reciprocation. God speaks and we listen. And when we speak, God listens. Yes, sometimes it is best to be silent and humble and accept the consequences of sin. It is uncomfortable to be on the receiving end of God's penetrating gaze, exposing us for the sinful people that we are. We're sort of like, God, look away, we're hideous. But at the same time, we can cry out, Lord, open your ears to our cries. Hear us, God, hear our prayer. I mean, in the end, this song of the heart, Psalm 39 It isn't an affirmation of human futility. It's an affirmation of faith. Because in the face of discouragement and despair and dust, we dare to speak to God and claim our relationship with God. So how do you do that? Well, One of the ways we can do that is when you practice the spiritual discipline of contemplation, sitting in God's presence. Christian contemplation is listening to God's voice, being shaped and formed by his word. It is spending time in this interplay between God and humans. Again, this sort of spiritual giant when it comes to the the disciplines of our faith. Richard Foster, he says, in Revelation 3.20, we're given these wonderful words of Jesus. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking, and if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. These, these words, he says, they were originally penned for believers, not for unbelievers, because Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and my heart, He's longing to eat with us, to commune with us. He desires this sort of perpetual Eucharistic feast in the inner sanctuary of the heart. Jesus is knocking and and contemplation opens the door. The thing is, you don't have to go to a monastery to practice contemplation. You can do that right in the midst of the noise and the hurry and the crowds of your ordinary everyday life. But you're the one who decides that. You're the one who decides if you're going to do that. I mean, you ever call someone and it rolls right over to voicemail? (laughs) You ever email somebody and you get that automated response, sorry, I'm not available or I'm out of the office or whatever it is? You ever see someone and you say, I'd love to, to get together with you and and they pull out their calendar and they go, well, I'm not available right now, not this week, maybe, ne- maybe the week after next week. God doesn't do that. The calls don't roll to voicemail and, and the emails don't get automated replies. And there's no pushing off for another week or another month on the calendar. God doesn't do that. The Lord never says, sorry, I'm not available right now. God's not the one who does that. You're the one. You're the one who says you're not available. You're the one who decides what your life will really be like in the midst of all the noise and the hurry and the crowds. God is the one knocking. Will you open the door? Now, I understand it might be helpful to give a little direction for contemplation. Of course, the reality is you learn to practice contemplation by actually practicing contemplation. But, but I can share some, some tips with you 
uh, to help you get started. First, don't confuse Christian contemplation with the concept of meditation that's centered in Eastern religions. They're just vastly different. Eastern meditation is an attempt to empty the mind. Christian contemplation is an attempt to fill the mind. You know, we want to have the mind of Christ. We're not trying to just empty, we're trying to fill. Eastern forms of meditation stress the need for detachment, becoming detached from the world. In Christian contemplation, it's not about detachment so much, but rather about attachment. Again, the focus is on being connected to Christ. The focus is on being filled with Christ rather than emptying. Secondly, Christian contemplation isn't some really difficult sort of thing and only a few professionals can do it. It's quite simple, really, to get away into the, let's say, the monastery of your imagination. So Richard Foster, he, he advises you set aside a, a specific time for contemplation. He says, find a, a place that's quiet, that's free from dis distractions and interruption. And so you know what that means, right? It, but you have to do it. Put away your phone. <laughs> Put away any other devices. If you can look out on a lovely landscape, that can, be a, that can be a beneficial thing, but it's not necessary. In the end, it's best to sort of have one designated spot. You know you're going to go there rather than searching for a different place each time. And then find a posture that is suitable for you. You know, in Scripture, we read everything from kneeling, you know, laying down completely on the floor, standing up with arms raised, you know, all those sorts of things. But in the end, most people are going to find that probably sitting is, is going to work the best. And then Richard Foster's son, Nathan, he wrote a, a book himself on spiritual disciplines. And, and he said that, that when he begins contemplation, he closes his eyes and he begins to take several breaths. He's breathing in several times, deep breaths. He's trying to sort of let go of the distractions and the concerns, the noise, the hurry, the crowds. And then there's, there's many ways to contemplate. There's many models of contemplation. But of course, for us in the Christian tradition, the, the meditation upon Scripture is the most central and fundamental. Now, this is different than studying Scripture. This isn't about exegesis, that's the technical term for, for what we can learn about Scripture. This isn't about being able to preach a sermon, it's not about being able to teach someone something, it's not about a Bible study, it's none of those sorts, sorts of things. Rather, it's much more devotional. It's reading Scripture slowly, internalizing and personalizing the Scripture passage. The German Lutheran pastor and World War II martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, just as you do not analyze the words of someone you love, but accept them as they are said to you, accept the word of Scripture and ponder it in your heart as Mary did. That's all. That's meditation. And again, remember, contemplation is sitting in God's presence. Listening to God's voice, it's being shaped and formed by the relationship with the one who created you from the dust of the earth and gives you life. Again, Richard Foster advises, remember, there's no hurry. Hurry is of the devil. <laughs> you take one single scripture story, a parable, a few verses, even a single word, and you allow it to take root deeply in you. You live the experience. And here it's good to follow the encouragement from Ignatius of Loyola to apply all of your senses to the scripture passage. That is, as you're contemplating, smell the sea and hear the lap of the water along the shore. See the crowd Feel the sun on your face or feel the hunger in your stomach. Descend, descend deeply into your wonderful Christian imagination and see what God shows you in the depths of your mind and heart and soul as you sit with the Lord. 
If you don't have much experience with this, when you begin, five minutes might seem like a long time. But that's okay. Henry Nouwen says, it is a habit, it is a practice that tends the inner fire of God and keeps it alive. And of course, practicing that spiritual discipline can grow from that five minutes into even extended periods of time. But, but even so, it doesn't take long to reset one's attention to the work of the Spirit in your life and, and throughout the world. And so taking the opportunity to contemplate, even for five minutes, it stokes that fire. It stokes the fire of your hope in the Lord and your imaginative interplay between the Lord God and yourself. Can you imagine how this world would change if we all answered the door with Jesus knocking at the door? If, if even for five minutes we, we left work and we got off Facebook and we shut off the phone and we found a quiet spot and we took a breath and we spent time in the presence of God. Will you practice contemplation? Sitting in God's presence. I close my eyes. Only for a moment, and the moment's gone. All my dreams pass before my eyes, a curiosity. Dust in the wind. All they are is dust in the wind. That's all right. This is Lent. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But our hope is in the Lord God Almighty who created us from the dust of the earth and gives us life. And this life means something. It's a gift. It is terrifyingly short and wonderfully awesome. Don't let the noise and the hurry of life crowd out the opportunity to be in the presence of God. Let us pray. First, let us offer praise, love, respect, and awe for God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Next, let us confess our sin and the brokenness of ourselves and this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now let us thank God and offer our gratitude for all that God has done in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us make our request known to God. Let us pray for the church and for Salem that we would be shaped and formed by the songs of the heart we hear in Scripture, that we would sing them in our lives and carry them with us in our minds. Especially, we pray for your help in practicing contemplation with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the deep needs of the world. In places of violence and warfare, give us the courage to lay down our weapons of death and promote life and well-being instead, the very peace of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those times when dark clouds of trouble are overtaken by the light of God's presence and new possibilities, and when the promise of resurrection life takes hold in us with sure and certain hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us pray for all in the path or wake of the novel coronavirus as the pandemic continues. We pray for an end, for the light at the end of the tunnel to give us hope, for a safe and effective and quicker rollout of vaccines to stop the spread of this virus and protect your children. We pray for hospitals and for our healthcare workers and your protection. Until this ends, let us love our neighbors 
by wearing masks, washing hands, distancing, and staying out of larger groups. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for ourselves, our families, and those we love, especially the family and friends of our dear sister, Jan Hutchison, who died this past Wednesday and whose private funeral service will be live streamed on February 27th. Wendy Cox's daughter, Sam Burns, who has been diagnosed with terminal cancer, was released from the hospital and is now staying with Wendy. Rhonda Johnson, who continues her battle and treatment with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Brenda Seaton, who has been diagnosed with COVID-19. Lee Borntrager, who had a medical procedure last week. And for Ann Luke and Rob Dreyer, who were engaged last week. Pastor John and Joy, as they transition from Salem to their new appointment. And for our new next pastor, we will be receiving. May God show us what he's doing and allow us to be a part of it. And let us pray now for those we lift up to the Lord silently in our hearts and minds, and for those we lift up aloud with our own voices. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, as the heavens were torn, open at Jesus' baptism, and the curtain in the temple was torn at his crucifixion. So now tear open anything that divides us from you or hides your presence in our lives or in the church. We desire to hear your voice of love, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and to see you clearly. Lead us to serve others faithfully as disciples of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Thanks for gathering with us for worship as we begin this season of Lent. I want to encourage you, really, please consider gathering with some friends for a weekly small group, either in person safely or online, 
We have small group materials that we can share with you that go along with our worship series. They're very good, and you can get those uh, from the church office. I think they're even going to be posted online, and uh, we'd love to help you get connected with that. Just, just contact the church office. Also, I'm very pleased to welcome a new member today here at Salem, Jan Graham. Jan is transferring from St. James Trinity here in Cedar Rapids, but she's been a part of our Salem congregation coming up on three years now. So I had the opportunity to have a conversation with her. She answered those membership questions, those vows. She promised to turn away from sin and to profess Jesus as Lord and Savior and to participate in the church with her prayers, her presence, her gifts, her service, and her witness. Welcome, Jan. Also, I have some more exciting news. The leadership board met this past week, and with the, uh, the positivity rate uh, staying down in our, in our county, we are going to start the process of re-entry. Now, it's going to be a slow process. It's going to be gradual, but we are starting that process. And so the leadership board is allowing small groups to be meeting in person uh, here at Salem during the month of March. That's very exciting. That's the first time we've done that, obviously, in, uh, in well, close to a year. And not only that, but we are going to offer an Easter morning worship service in the parking lot so that we can gather together. That's the first Sunday in April. It's uh, not technically going to be a sunrise service because that's pretty early at 6.45 and we want the opportunity for people to, to come and, and be in person in the parking lot. Uh, so it'll probably be more like at 8.30 in the morning and of course we'll still have our online Easter worship service at 9.30, that premiere, and of course it's accessible anytime online, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or, or our website. Now, Today is the third Sunday of the month. If you're watching this live, I will be offering the Sacrament of Holy Communion online. And this will be on a, a Facebook Live video. Very soon after the worship service or the, pre, the video premiere ends. So that'll be a little bit after 10 a.m. If you'd like to receive the Sacrament of Holy Communion, I'm going to invite you to gather some sort of bread and some sort of juice and uh, find us on Facebook Live for that soon after this ends. Now receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>